I promised I was going to bring you a master, a master of his craft. There's not many of them out there in the world. Literally in tennis, there's not many of this guy you're looking at right here, right now. I want you to appreciate what you have in front of you. You have a USPTA NPTR Master Pro. Jorge, I hate to admit it. I looked at what you had to do to be a Master Pro, and I said, no way. I'm not even going to attempt it. Forget it. That would take me like three yeah. lifetimes to achieve that. Okay. So that you've done it in both is amazing. And he is the only pro to be pro of the year in both. Now, did you do that in separate years or the same year? Separate. It's actually not exactly that. There's been pros that have been um, a pro for both PTR and USPTA. But I think maybe not master pro in each and pro in each. Uh, but I did, uh, one was like 2015 and one was like 2017, uh, was the, the more recent one, but yeah, it's, uh, if, if you stick at it long enough and don't die, <laughs> hopefully some good things get put out and then you get recognized. Well, that, that's, that's very nice. We got Brad on from Florida. Right. Uh, tennis files is on and he called yeah. you a legend. The mayor bonds calling you a legend. Um, so anyway, we, guys, come on in, say hello. We already got 40 people on really fast, so that's super exciting. And tonight what we're going to do, Maribon, you're going to like this in a second, and you're going to see it. You're going to see why he's a master pro. He's going to show you why he's a master pro. I've got good faith in this. But um, Jorge is going to um, talk about three lessons. He's going to give you three lessons on mental toughness. But before we do this, Jorge, I don't know if you've been watching our live streams or not. We're yeah. getting... Hillary from uh, Ottawa, Canada. Rick Tomlin from Canada is there. Uh, but I've been doing music trivia, and and we started with Marabon. Marabon like doesn't know who Billy Joel is, doesn't know who Prince is. Like it's like literally clueless unless it was like, you know, Miley Cyrus or something like that. That's wow. like what he knows. But uh, I'm gonna play a classic for you, and okay. I I predict. That you're gonna now, Will. If you can't believe this, I thought Will would have got this last night. I played um, Fortunate Son, and he didn't know it. Uh, Can you know Fortunate Son, right? That song. Who, who sings Fortunate Son? Uh, that I don't know. You uh, don't know? Oh, all right, I'm already disappointed. Oh, I, like if that song was playing now, I probably know half the words. And then I, I, it's I, CCR, Credence Clearwater uh, Revival. Okay, yeah. you, you might not know this. All right, I'm going. I'm going all out classic though on you. All right, okay. guys, Never as soon as you know it, start commenting. Are you ready, Jorge? We're starting right. the music trivia. Jorge Capistani, the master pro. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know it? Hmm? Yeah, do you know it? What is it? Um. I don't know it, but I know where I heard it, and it's in, it's in, um, it's in all those like movies, like those war movies and stuff. You don't know the name of that song? Um, no. I Do you know who sang the song? Uh, no. If you played it for a little bit longer, I might. Oh, come on. That's like you should know that already, dude. I'm totally disappointed in you. <laughs> that, was, that was Jimi Hendrix all along the way. Yeah. Okay. I get you. My God! It doesn't count when I say I get it now. I already, I already got tipped off. Ah, choker. Well, That's know, it, guys. I need some mental toughness tips. I got to channel my own mental. Live toughness. stream over, and I'm taking away Jorge Capistani's master credentials. Okay. All right. Anyway, no big deal. All right. He's he's here to talk tennis, guys, not to talk music. So this is this is why he doesn't know who Jimi Hendrix is and all along the watchtower because he's so busy thinking of amazing tennis stuff. So yeah. Jorge, t tell us what you have for us tonight. Well, first of all, thanks and welcome everybody. I'm glad that we could spend some time together. Um, and I want to give you a little shout out, Peter, because uh, tennis con four now and. Uh, when I think about all the stuff that you've put together, I mean, I, I put out content like you do, but probably not as much, but just organizing this whole thing and all the people that you have, I was telling one of my members today, they were asking me because they get my emails and I said, just think of what you can get. I mean, like all those people, like give me a break. So you're very collaborative and everybody likes you. And if you guys probably figured it out by watching Peter's stuff, uh, he's one of the guys online that's super nice. He's, he loves everybody. He's got no drama. So, Kudos to you and great job pulling this off. So, Thank you so um, much. 
what I'm going to be talking about is mental toughness. So I've been coaching 36 years um, for a long, long time. And um, mental toughness, like, as a player, I came to tennis late, and I definitely had mental toughness issues. I would get nervous. I'd choke. I had all kinds of mental deficiencies on the court. Um, and then as a young teacher, you know, when I started teaching, I thought I could teach strategy pretty good. I could teach technique and I could spar with people, but I always felt a little inferior, uh, in my ability to co coach mentally, like coach mental skills. Um, and so over the years I've learned, I was always been very, very interested in that. Like one of the guys that I look up to in this area is Dr. Jim Lair. And if you don't know, Dr. if you're a tennis coach, you probably for sure do. But I went, I mean, I study all this stuff. I'm a, I'm a friend of his now. And the 16-second cure, when he kind of invented that thing back in the day, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is like a system that you can use on the court. Um, and um, I actually went and I got certified through his. My wife and I both got certified through his mental toughness certification course because I wanted to learn. And that wasn't even that long ago. I'm always kind of learning stuff. So most of what I have been able to do that I think is halfway decent in the mental realm is not tricks and stuff. It's just years of seeing my own drama and players' drama and they're feeling like they can't win. So all those tricks that I've learned, um, that's it's just experience, okay? I don't have a degree in it, but when I can talk to people, usually I can, you know, in this area of mental toughness now, usually they're like, whoa, that, that was pretty helpful. So, um, yeah, because a lot of people don't get it. Like, if someone's angry on the court, they choke. No one wants that. And a lot of inefficient coaches say well don't, don't get nervous well if you tell someone that's nervous not to get nervous what well, it's like completely useless i'm like you think i want to be nervous or why wow, you're such a hot head out there don't be such a hot head you gotta come you think i want i woke up today and like i can't wait to play tennis because 10 minutes into it i'm gonna be really pissed off at myself <laughs> so no one does that okay yeah. telling yeah. people how to do it or to will themselves out doesn't work so um, as you know, my presentation is going, I think, on Thursday for Tennis Con. It's a, kind of a mental day. And um, I have this bigger course that you've seen kind of behind the scenes. It's almost done on mental toughness. It's kind of a revision of my original course. But I reworked it all. And for Tennis Con 4, um, on Thursday, I'm going to go live with the top t my top 10 tips regarding mental toughness. So this little shorter session, I'm going to do three. Okay, so tonight we're going to do three. I'm going to pull two from what Thursday is and one that people won't see on Thursday. So with your permission, I think I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let me go back to where it says share. Share. While you're sharing your screen, Jorge, I just want to point out and thank people that we are at 121 on to watch the Master Pro. And you guys are going to get an amazing lesson. Share it with your friends. Put it on Facebook. Maribon, go make a TikTok video dancing and tell people to watch this. And uh, it's going to be really awesome stuff. Just think about the three tips you're going to get tonight and how good they are. I already know what they are. And just think how awesome the 10 are. It's This is a great lesson. Okay. So can you see their Tennis Con 4 live kickoff? I sure can. Okay. So this is a PowerPoint. I'm just going to go through it. Um, and let's just get started. So the first little topic I want to talk about today is pre-match nerves, okay? Um, when I talk to people, a lot of my own players, and I've been teaching them for many years, so um, it's amazing how many people in our sport struggle with pre-match nerves, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, on a scale of 1 through 10, we can all, everybody's on the scale somewhere, right? So 10 is you're like super nervous, you're a wreck, you want to throw up before every match, and one is you're completely calm. It doesn't stress you out at all. And the, what I've known over the years is like most people are five or more. The average person in my life is five or more. But some people are up there like nine and tens. I have one kid that was really good. He won the Midwest clothes. He was nationally ranked. We're talking top 20 in the country. And he was a nine or a 10. And literally every match, even if he was playing locally, and he was playing a kid that there's almost impossible to lose to. He was so much better. He would be in, like literally almost throwing up. So we just have to acknowledge that on that scale, everybody is different. Okay. Uh, it doesn't make you good or bad person to just recognize it. So when I competed, um, I started late. Uh, my default settings on that scale was about a seven. Uh, 
before most matches, I had a good amount of nerves. Okay. And having some nerves is not a problem in and of itself. Kind of shows you care to a degree. Um, one funny statement I heard, but I like it is you don't really, the goal is not to get rid of your pre-match butterflies. The goal is just to get the butterflies to fly in formation. Just kind of accept that. Hey, like that. this is going to happen. I don't have to freak out, but if you think like, oh, I'm nervous. So therefore, and this is the other big mistake. People get nervous and then they equate that. Oh, I'm mentally weak. I must, I'm just a broken loser out here. I can't believe I'm nervous. So it's a normal state to be nervous. So number two, what, what would you rate me as if I, for my matches, I would go to the restroom probably like 30 times before a match within the hour. Is that, yeah. that's well, probably yeah. high on the scale, right? Yeah, you probably lived around seven or eight years. <laughs> so the other thing that, um, I've learned over the years is that most tennis players are really bad at tennis empathy. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. So imagine this play now. I've coached 63,000 hours on the court, but I've coached another tw almost 20,000 hours at tournaments because I used to be a high performance coach and, you know, that I did travel with these kids and I watched hours and hours of tournaments. So I sat for thousands of hours with players before matches, after matches, during matches, watching them. And one thing that dawned on me is I would sit with my player, let's say her name is Linda, and before a match, <clears throat> and I could tell she was nervous. She's, you know, she's telling me she's nervous. Everything about her, she's all worried, um, and she's playing maybe whoever, Jennifer. Uh, and then, you know, I'll walk over and I'll talk to Jennifer, maybe as another one of my students, or maybe not. And I talk just for a few minutes and I go, holy crap, Jennifer's freaking just as nervous. She's over here thinking Linda's cool and calm uh, and she's all frazzled and worried about the match outcome. And she doesn't realize that the other person's likely in the same boat. Okay. So empathy, your ability to feel what, your other, what the other person's feeling. Us tennis players, we kind of suck at that. We always default to like, I feel nervous and I'm looking across the, the net to Peter and I can't see his feelings, but I just... We assume, well, he's cool as a cucumber, cucumber. So what I've done over the years is, you know, I told that's my two-story player. So I give him an assignment. And it's very corny, very basic, but as basic as it is, it works. So I'll sit with my students and I'll say before the match, if I'm with them, it's even better. But if not, I'll give it as homework. I'll say, I want you to look at your opponent before the match. Find him in the lobby, wherever you are, and just watch him. Watch him closely for three, four, five minutes. Uh, and see if you can guess. You won't be able to, obviously, but see if you can try to assess what his inner thoughts are. What is he going? Is he walking around confident? Is he, is he fumbling through his bag? But I tell you, this number one thing, This I'm almost done with this one, but the number one point I wanted to make here is that it's normal to have pre match nerves. If they're debilitating, you can do other things, but it's normal. And two, we have to, we have to do a way better job of just putting our – recognizing that the other guy is probably just as nervous and just as freaked out. So it's not just a one way street. So that's tip number one. Um, number two, um, Love this. this one here is something as a coach. So let me just kind of explain this scale here. So um, on the left, you see these numbers zero through 10, that's ability or skill. So 10 is you're playing high and zero, you're playing really low. And along the bottom, you know, from left to right, we have arousal levels, okay? So a one arousal, two arousal, kind of where this guy is, that's basically low energy, okay? He's too low in his energy or his arousal, his, you know, fired up uh, And then way over here on this side, okay, like eight or nine, that's too high, okay? So really what we want to strive for is the sweet spot. Now, when I explain this, a lot of people immediately go, wait a minute, why this this is a bell curve. Why is it a bell curve? Um, because it's tennis. So remember, uh, eight or nine or ten. This is someone that's so aroused and jacked up. Think of an MMA fighter just before he runs out to touch gloves. I mean, these guys are jacked up. Uh, but tennis is not that kind of sport. Having that much agitation is not a, a play a way to play in an ideal performance state. It just isn't. So you don't want to be too low where you're low energy and you're not saying anything, you know, wrist slap, you're kind of, you look almost lethargic on the court. And you don't want to be way over here where this guy is, where he's kind of a maniac and he's on edge and he's just looking for trouble, okay? So if we look at my, my buddy here on the left, okay, 
Um, what I want is him to migrate. See how I moved him to the top? This is what I want. Somehow for that player, let's assume I'm coaching this guy or you're a player and you are that guy. How can I get someone who's super low energy to move more towards the middle where their performance is going to? So the, the assumption that we're making here is that when your arousal level is four to six, you're kind of into it, but you're not too agitated. That's your ideal sweet spot for playing. Okay. So I could just tell that person, hey, you know, show some more energy. And that's my coaching tip, which is basically useless. I mean, you got to coach them, right? Yeah. Most people don't want to be there. They don't even know they're there. So the way you coach them is you, so watch in the upper left here, we're going to put some words up here. So I would literally spend time coaching people like this, how to get to that next state to a better arousal level. So I would teach them, you got to say, come on. Okay. You got to slap your wrist. I'll put a few more up. You got to say, let's go. Uh, these are all monsters. You got to have boxer feet. Imagine, you know, how Rafa's, you know, at the coin toss or sometimes at the net, he's already like boxer's feet, he's, like freaking people out. Um, you got to show some fist pumps. That's a physical one. Uh, you got to do some thigh slaps. So all these things here are things that I can do and train, doable, actual things that might make my guy, and if I do it right, then he's going to take that arrow trip and he'll find himself up there, okay? So that's how I would help someone that has too low energy. The first thing for everybody watching right now is in your mind, try to place yourself. You might say, well, last Tuesday I was a two, but the Friday before I was an eight. Well, try to find your average. Like if you ask your friends or your coaches, or your your doubles partner, where do you? What's your average? What's your factory setting? So Peter, I'll ask you. On this arousal state, there's no right or wrong answer. When you competed a lot, where would you have put yourself? What, um, Seven or eight. Okay, so you were kind of wired up. Very amped up. Yeah. Okay, and you know that sounds good, right? I don't want people to equate. No level with effort level because people say well don't you should i not try hard this is totally two different scales if effort level should be high that should always be high but arousal we're talking emotional energy that's what i'm talking about well so just to, to stop you for a second one thing that was very interesting is i couldn't believe that he was this perceptive is i took a lesson with rick macy on the forehand and i it, you know, we just, I was stone cold too. Like I literally got out of the car and just the courts had dried. He's like, all right, let's go at showtime. And like, as soon as I set up the cameras, he's feeding me balls. I'm super nervous because number one, this is going to be like a huge course. I hope it's going to be a huge success. Rick Macy's a legend. I want to look good on camera. So I'm just praying like when I go to hit the ball, that it's going to look halfway decent. And I start out and I'm hitting the ball really well. And I think I'm doing great. And he goes, time out come on in here, bring it in. And he says, right off the bat, I see five things you got to work on. Number one's relax. Number two's relax. So he's like, basically he said that I need to relax. And he said, he's like, I can already tell, this is after five balls. He's like, I can already tell that effort and intensities in your wheelhouse. And that's a strength, but it's probably also what kept you two levels below where you could have been if you didn't have it. I was like, and, and I'll tell you what, I think he just totally nailed me too. Yeah, that's classic. Um, I love it. I, I would be just like you, by the way. I was I was born, came out of the factory, came out of the womb at around a seven or an eight. Uh, more often than not, I was a little too jacked up, and I was, you know, I, and when you're up there, seven or eight, as you're not, your neighbor is anger. <laughs> so things go wrong with boom within five minutes. I could be really angry at myself or whatever. So okay, back to the scale. So we this, we talked about the low energy guy and getting him high. So how about this other guy? He's over here. He's too jacked up. You see he's down lower. His skill level isn't too good. we got to get this guy up at the top of the mountain as well. We want we want to see him do that migration, okay? So, again, how do I do that? Do I, I can't just wish it on him. So slightly different. You can see the words that I'll train him. So I would teach this person to say to themselves between points, relax, stay calm, big breaths face the back fence, which means you're basically controlling your eyes. You're not letting your eyes wander. They keep your eyes on your string. So those are all things. You see those two boxes? You know, look at how different they are. One guy saying, come on, let's go get himself off. Those are all words that will get you pumped up that you're not. And these over here, you're two pumped up. You're going the other way. Okay. So it's just coaching. So I spent a lot of time on the court 
teaching people this, like figure about this, and people will, will get it because if they think like, ah, oh, this actually might help me win a match or two or be more calm, they're kind of interested. So I just use those words, uh, relax, say, be fit, and we could probably come up with a dozen more if we needed to. And if I do my job, and then boom, we'll have that arrow, and my buddy will have made it to the top of the thing. Okay. Mm. So that's tip number two, basically. It has to do with arousal levels. And the takeaways are the highest arousal level does not equate into the best state for play. Okay. You want to be in the ideal performance state, which is that sweet spot there. And those are some ideas that if you're not, you know, even right now, if you did a chat, I don't know saying you should, but if you did vote, you see people all over the place. If you say, tell us who your factory settings are, where are you naturally? Uh, and you'll see twos, fours, sixes. Now, if you're lucky and your natural state is a four, five, or six, you probably compete pretty well. You probably don't have a lot of nerves or angst when you compete. All right, so let's go to our third. Wait, before we go to the third one, I have, I have a couple, especially for – Again, another Rick Macyism because it totally made sense to me as a uh, as a coach when he said it, I thought it was funny. Uh, I went down like a year before I had my private lesson with him, and I filmed him with a, a student called uh, her name is her name is Bella, and uh, she was hitting her shot. And he said how her forehand's a little wild. He goes because she's a wild animal, but he goes that's okay. I like wild animals. I'd rather have a wild animal animal than someone who's like in a coma, and. Yeah. You know, I've had students where I am kind of like, are you in a coma? Like, are you with us today? Yeah. And, and I've always found those students the toughest to have them come out of their shell. And I've told them things like, you know, maybe develop another kind of personality. Like Beyonce says she's shy, but she's got mm -hmm. Sasha Fierce or, you know, some, something like that. Um, what have you done with people that you've noticed just really they're just so laid back? Yeah. And, they, and they just can't seem like you have any other tricks up your sleeve or how long does it take yeah. to get them out of their shells? I actually have a story about this. So one of the kids I used to coach who was quite good, his name was Tony. Um, he was 12 years old. He won the Midwest close, which is big. You're the number one ranked player in the whole five states. Um, always ranked top couple of the, of the section played division one tennis. I mean, this guy, he made nationals played Kalamazoo every year. But Tony was super shy and super low energy and very non-confrontational. So he would, you know, and this was okay in the 12s, but when he was getting into the 14s, especially the 16s, he's playing all these other guys and they're feisty and they're competing. They're not feisty like buttholes. They're not being naughty. They're just fighting, you know, like Rafa shows so much fight. And my guy was showing too much low energy, okay? His effort was good, but if you were to, if you and I were watching him, Peter, two courts away, we'd be like, hmm, that guy looks bored or like he doesn't want to be here. Um, so I would try to work with him on that. And this is a true story. I said, look, we have to work on some of these between point skills. That's what I'm really referring to. So I, here's what I want to do. I'm going to feed you to three balls, uh, forehand, a backhand, then a short ball. And the short ball, I want you to come up. I'll set it up. And you're going to hit a winner on it or probably hit a winner on it. And as soon as you hit that winner, these are dead balls. We're not playing them out. I want you to hit that winner, go, come on, make a fist bump, slap yourself in the thigh, and walk back and get ready for me to feed again. And he kind of goes, as soon as I told him what I want him to do, he kind of goes, uh, you know, because he's not, he's, he doesn't like doing that. It's, you see, he feels weird mm -hmm. to do that. I said, I don't care, man. I'm your coach. You're going to do it. So I go back, and he does it, and he hits a winner, and he, kinda, and he doesn't do it at all. So I'm like, time, come back up. Listen, you understand what I'm saying? I'm serious here. I want you to to do this exercise we go through it again he, he hits the, the third ball for a winner he goes come on I'm like, whoa time out and this is a true story oh, the, i believe you on the adjacent court we had this other little girl who was a 12 and under top 10 in the country her name was katie and katie was feisty katie co competed like crazy so i said time brian can i have katie and i brought katie over here and i said katie here's my goal i want you to show tony something I'm going to feed you three balls. The third one's going to be short. You're going to come up, hit a winner. As soon as you're done, you're going to fist pump, kind of like Rafa. Back then, Rafa didn't exist. So fist pump, slap your thigh, and go back. Uh, she does it, and she does it like world class. It's like Rafa, mini Rafa right there. And I look at Tony and go, that's what I want. And we went about 30 minutes of him not being able to do it. He just could not do it. I mean, obviously, he could do it if I – 
had a gun and shot his foot, he probably would say, <laughs> hey, being serious, I better do it. But he just couldn't bring himself to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, but my point is, what what worked and what's worked for others is practicing it um, on the court. It's really you got to think about your between point because during the point itself, it's hard for people to judge your mental toughness. Most of that becomes apparent between the points. Yes. So I would say that you have two performances. Um, I never knew this. I wish I did. But I always view tennis as I perform during the point, and then between the points, that's not a performance. That's rest period. But if you want to see the way you can tell if someone's mentally tough or not is you just look at them between the points. If they're being a maniac, be, like during, like if they hit a back and go, oh my god, you know, and they're doing it during the rally, that's like a whole other level of crazy. I, most people will show their emotions between points. It's way easier to see during that time. So I train people that this is a second performance. All right. So you have your, and often, I, if I had a nickel for every time I said this. I did it to my daughter. I said it to tons of my students. Before they match, I give them a high five. They go out. I go, I want the perfect between point performance. That's the last words they heard out of Coach Ori. I didn't care about the match or score because I knew if they did perfect in their between point performance, there's a really, really good chance that we're going to play well that day and walk off the court with a win or at least feeling like they played well. So that's something they can is more controllable than the outcome of, a, of an actual shot. So that's how I do it, and I, I – preach constantly that there's two performances um you know the between point one is probably even more important than the during the point one i got i first of all that was great i got st- i got to recognize michael loriola who is this the michael loriola from Ca- from california where I, we i used to give him private lessons all right he used to love to imitate Nastasi and all these people and i did a good mac and row and we usually did a lunchtime lesson uh-huh. And so one day, and it was at Almond Valley Athletic Club. Have you ever been to Almond Valley Athletic Club in San Jose? You ever been there, Jorge? Mm-hmm. No. It's probably the only clubs you haven't been in. They used to have the girls and boys, uh, 16s and 18s nationals. Anyway, okay. I'm giving Mike a lesson. And uh, all of a sudden, I start to go off on him like Johnny Mac. Like I'm doing a total act, but I'm, I'm ranting and yelling at him. And <laughs> And I just thought we were completely alone. And then all of a sudden I look up on the deck and there's this guy looking at us and he's just like looking at me like, because <laughs> I was the director of the club. So he was like horrified at the way I was yelling at my student. <laughs> Michael is laughing his head off as I'm yelling at him. Uh, good time. It's Michael. It's the real Michael. Michael, I miss you, I miss you buddy. That's one of my favorite teaching moments ever. I love it. Continue. Sure. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, We're almost to 200 people, by the way. We're at 198. All right. I love it. Okay, so um, let me make sure I get the screen up here. So you can see the. All right. Can you see right now the tactics audit? I see. Okay. So one of the things I discovered as a coach is that a lot of our mental toughness issues actually can be traced to what you have in your toolbox. Like it is somewhat related to your game, right? So they're somewhat linked. So basically what the more tools you have, the more a tool is something you can do. Okay. It's got to be deployable. I can slice. If you know about slice and you can do slice in a practice, but you're not going to do it in a match, then you don't own it. It's not deployable. So the more tools you have that you can deploy, the more you're going to win. It's just, that's it. As a matter of fact, I, I have a, a quote I say, the job, the, really the only job of a tennis player is to constantly be adding more and more usable, quote unquote, usable tactics to your game. So consider my toolbox. So I show up to a match and I'm playing Peter Freeman. I open up my toolbox and inside my toolbox, I see a slice, I see a drop shot, I see a serve volley, I see a change up, I see a chip and charge, I see loopers. And then Peter opens up his box and he goes, here's what I came to work with. I got a, a consistency, and that's it. That's the only thing in this toolbox. So we have to acquire more and more tools. And I think one of the classic mistakes everyday players like us make is we we like a tool. Like I'm pretty good at the, at the consistency tool or the power tool. And that's, that's what I want. I only have two tools. So you have to constantly be adding. If you can't do a new skill a year from now, then you wasted a year. There, you should be able to do something. Well, what should I do? 
Well, there's a million things. Can you chip and charge? Can you hit drop shots? Can you slice? Can you change up the face lock? Yeah, you, you can go on forever. So in order for me to sit with a student and, and assess their game, I, I do what was what we call a tactics audit. Okay. So I'm going to show you exactly the sheets that I do when I do a tactics audit. So I'm going to just watch my screen here. Um, this is a fictitious player. We're calling her Sally. Um, she's a 3.5. And by the way, on the scale here, uh, 0 to 10 is your how well you're playing. And these are all the tactics. Can you slice? Can you have on the bottom? Can you drop shot? Can you move ball? Can you attack the net? Can you defend and run like crazy? Can you mix up the pace? Can you swim volley? It could be more. It could, it could be different. Okay. So how are we going to measure? I measure two things generally. Uh, can you do it in practice? I want to know that. And then the secondly, more important one is this red line. Can you deploy it in a match? Okay, so you see the difference there, Peter? We're looking at this very first skill, slice. And let's just say, for example, that this is where Sally is with her slice. She can't do it in, she cannot do it in practice yet. And she's definitely not going to do it in a match, right? So no problem with this. Just it's not good or bad. That's just fact. All right, so how about her drop shot? Well, we'll see. Her drop shot, hmm, kind of the same. She not going to do it in practice and certainly not going to do it in a match. Okay, how about her moon ball skills? Whoa. Okay, look at this. Interesting. She can do it in practice, and she's close to do it in a match. She's probably a little nervous and maybe doesn't want to do it, but that's that shot. Okay, let's look at another one. Her, how about her attacking net skills? Er, too low. She doesn't, she, you know, she's pretty far away. Okay, this next one, how good is she at defending and running? Whoa, we found something. Look at that. That's something that she can not only do in a match, but she can do, um, or in practice, she can do it in a match. And how about uh, mixing up the pace? Okay, and then serve volley? Mm, no way. Okay, so if you look at that, look at that just for a second, and you see that she's all over. This is Everybody would have a different personal scale, right? Mine would look different than yours, Peter, and everybody's would look different. Um, but I want to show you something. What's the one and only thing that that rises above this deployable in a match thing? Defend and run, which can win a lot of matches. Right. So if that's the only thing she can do, and by the way, you're right, that one of all of them would be super good to have at a, at a rec level. But here's my point. If this is what she has, this is Sally the day of the match right there. All that other stuff? It just doesn't matter, dude, because you, you don't own it. It's not going to show up with you, all right? So let's let's go because I got one more person here. This, now we're going to do another fictitious player, Bill. Okay, Bill's a 4.0. And let's just quickly put up all his, his numbers here. And this is where Bill comes out in the scale of things, okay? He's got two things he can do. He can attack the net. And actually, he loves that. He can serve volley, so you can see what type of player is. His slice, his drop shot, all these are below. This is really far below, okay? So guess what? On the day of the match, remember the day of the match? Mm -hmm. That's him. He's playing like Paul Anacone. He's got, exactly. He's going to go to war with basically two things, Okay. But here's, the, here's where people get mixed up. This next slide uh, is kind of interesting. So this is just, I'm going to just put them all up real quick. So you look at these, and people say, at the top, you can say, uh, these are all the same. And when I show this to my players, they kind of go, well, they don't look the same. They look all different. Um, but they're the same in that every single one of them is below deployable so if you don't dare deploy it it doesn't matter if it's close you still don't dare to deploy it so your certain volley skills which are way underdeveloped and your slice way more developed but still under this is the magic box okay now this could be an eight or whatever i, I just put it here because this is my sense skills 10 is like you really own it and you love it. it's a weapon and seven is you're pretty good at it and right about seven is when i find you can deploy it. okay so all these things are the same because if you um, can't do them, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're miles away from doing it or close to doing it, but don't dare, you still don't dare. So let's go to this next slide. Um, watch this new line up here. This is Jane, 4.5, another fictitious player. 
I, sometimes when I work with people, I'll put this other line here called the weapon. Level nine is when a shot or a skill raises rises to the level of a weapon. So let's just go quickly. We'll put Jane's uh, thing up here. Okay, so Jane, four or five player, she looks like she has two things that are above that line. That Well, first of all, she has three things she can deploy in a match. She can do this in a match, this in a match, this in a match. But two of these things are actually weapons like her moonball skills are wicked and she's really good at mixing up the plays okay again these are all fictitious players but it's a really good way to kind of measure yourself when i sit with people and i go through their personal tactic and they realize that so many shots are below this deployable line and they go no wonder i freaking a wreck out there because i go to war with no weapons and i'm always trying to find a way to win i don't have the tools so that in and of itself does put mental stress on you. It can make you nervous. It can make you anxious. So even though this is a tactic that's skill oriented, it's closely tied uh, to your thing. So let's go to this next one here. Um, my takeaway is you don't need to have every tool. So I don't want people looking at this and say, oh, wow, I got lots to go. I got a little slice, a drop shot, a boom, an attack, a defense. Oh, so many things because you really don't. So in this example, you can see, watch my screen here. Um, on this person, let's say this is you, Peter, uh, fictitious Peter. Um, Peter already has the moon ball that he can deploy, and he can also deploy uh, defend and run. That's He's already doing that. But now, as your coach, Peter, or you as a player, you look at your game. This is why you want to do the audit and say, so what's Peter? what should Peter do next? Do you think Peter should try to take attacking your net and do that? Look at how far he has to go. As your coach, I would probably say to you, look it, screw this one, dude. You're mild. <laughs> yeah, right. Molly, forget it. I don't think uh, Agassi, just to put it in perspective, Agassi wasn't like, I think this is Agassi. And I don't think Brad Gilbert was like, hey, dude, we got to fix your serve volley skills. You don't have to have them all. But you know what I would do? I see this one's kind of close. This one's kind of close. So this is what I would do. i say, let's take that one and put it up there because you're already halfway there. That one can go up. And this other one while we're here, mix up pace, let's go with that. So now you're being smart about what you're doing. Now you got, you know, five things above the net. And guess what? This is okay. You see attack and net down there, a little crappy bar? That's what I think about that one. And this one over here, don't bother. You do not need to master every single skill. I'd rather have you be a master of some um, as opposed to, you know, mastering I'd rather have you master one or two than a jack of all trades and a master of none. Okay, so that that old saying. So what I would do, um, and if you watch tennis, uh, you can watch me for free on Thursday. You you'll see this. This is like the little list that I have. I have this as a printable sheet, um, and I would tell every one of my students, I want you to personally do it. So you fill in that line. This would be me. And you fill in this one, and you just kind of. Do your own little audit. And then after you, you do this, you might have to sit with a coach because you might say, oh, I can deploy a drop shot for sure. And the coach is like, dude, you don't do that because you last time you tried to do that, you almost had a heart attack. Okay, so you have to be honest with yourself. But if you did nothing more than just do a little uh, audit of your, um, of your tactics, <clears throat> it could go a long way in alleviating, you know, a, a ton of this stuff. So I'm going to... Um, let me see if I can get out of here and go back to you, Peter. Um, did, did I stop sharing my screen? I hope. Uh, I. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. I love I love that. Uh, there's a couple of things as you were saying that that remind me of some things. I mean, first of all, Bruce Lee said, "I fear the man. I don't fear the man who um, does ten thousand kicks one time. I fear the man who does ten thousand." 10,000? One kick 10,000 times. Yeah. That's what Whatever. He Basically, he fears the man who just does one <clears> thing 10,000 <throat> times. That's who he fears, not the one who does 10,000 different kicks who does it one time. Right. He wants you to practice it over and over again. That's who he's afraid of. And the other thing is I, I think that this is what a lot of people who – and I love online students. I love them. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's people online. I think it's – people at, at the local courts is you'll watch a tip on YouTube or you'll take a lesson with your coach and you'll get super juiced because like you learn something new and you're so excited to use it in your match. 
And then you come back heartbroken because you're like, well, that totally didn't work in a match. And you either start thinking, I suck, or maybe I shouldn't be taking lessons. I'm just wasting my money because, and the thing is, is if you're trying to learn a slice serve or, or get that continental grip, you know, don't stress that this because the coach says, you know, you have the frying pan grip. And if you're not using the continental grip, it's not really a real serve. It is a real serve. You throw the ball up and it goes in the box. It's a real serve. Right. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't learn the continental grip, but it also doesn't mean that you just go out there and use it the right, you know, the yeah. first time out there because the coach says the continental grip is the only way you can develop a real serve. It doesn't mean that you have to use right. it that Sunday. And I love how you use that word deployable because what I tell my students, like, look, you when do you use it? It's like, because there's so many people who are online who are super smart and have businesses. I said, imagine, you know, your business product that you're developing, you want to deploy it in a match when you can go sell it at Walmart. Like when you say, I'm going to put it on the shelf and people can go in and buy it and bring it home. And it's not going to, it's going to fall apart into a piece of crap. That's when you use it into a match right. and, and you don't have to be in a rush. It's okay if it takes a year or two. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be done in yeah. two hours, two weeks, two months. Yeah, so I like what you're saying there because I another word I use with my students a lot is dabble. Okay, so I use your Bruce Lee example, right? Uh, I will do that chart with with one of my students, and they'll say, "Wow, uh, there's four things here that are under the line of deployable that I want to work on them." And then then what they do is they start down the path of working on all four. Huge mistake. That's dabbling, and they're all going to go just a teeny bit more, but the so I would say to that person, like you said, with the kicks, don't do 10,000 kicks. Do just one kick, do a 10,000. So I would say, look, when I worked with private lesson students, I used to do a lot of privates. I would always work on projects. Okay, So if I had you, Peter, I would say, okay, uh, Peter, what are our projects for the fall? You're 12 years old. You're a lefty, pretty good player. Um, let's work on adding consistency and maybe uh, way more spin in your serve. Now, I have these other things in the bank. Uh, eventually, I want you to have more power. I want you to be able to serve body. I want you to be able to chip and charge. All these things, but not at one time. Okay, one maybe two, and and I think what what you described there that scenario. I took a lesson. It was good. I uh, yay. It, they you you walk away from the lesson. I think it's deployable. Oh my god, this is great. And then you go out. You lay a big fat egg. You're like, oh, that wasn't deployable at all. I'm stuck between. I can do it in practice. The, the, those two lines are super helpful for me and my coaching. So I would strongly suggest pick one or two things and stay with it till you get it above the line. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll make a confession. There's been times where I picked a thing for someone and we work on it, worked on it. It's taking too long. We're like, you know what? This is, we're boarding this one. My bad. You got a little bit better at that skill, but it's not worth it. It's not efficient. I don't think it's worth doing that much more on your serve volley. You're just not going to be a serve volleyer. The other thing about recognizing skill, because I, I asked this of our, our little kids that are pretty good. I said, who can serve? Who knows what serve volley? Who can serve volley? And they go, oh, I can serve volley. Because they can. They can serve and go in and volley in a practice especially. The better question is, who can serve volley in a match? And a better question yet is, who can serve volley in a match when the score is tight? That's when you really know. Because I have 12-year-olds that are two feet tall that can serve volley. I wouldn't even recommend it, okay? I can do, a lot of them can do it just because they understand what it is. Oh, chip and charge, yeah, I know what that is. You know what, Sally, you don't chip and charge. You you know what chip and charge is. You don't own it. It's not right. deployable. So don't get those two mixed up. Um, when I do this audit, and it's shocking to me how many times people overrate themselves. Chip yeah. and charge, serve volley, and they put it above the line. I go, dude, when's, you literally never serve volley. Yeah. You have it here above the thing. Oh, I can serve volley. You're mixing up what you can do in practice, what you'll dare do in a match. That's the better measure. Uh, there's something you've been saying that 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 I also want to talk about. And and even before you start to talk about like 12 year old and this and that, uh, another mistake that I think um, and it'll be interesting to see your thoughts. I mean, I've worked with juniors, adults. And one of the things that, that adults kind of uh, are insecure about is they'll, especially when they see a hot shot junior, they'll go, oh, I wish I started when I was younger. Well, first of all, no, you don't, because a lot of the kids that you see, they're incredible. Mm -hmm. By the time they're out of college, they're burned out. They never play again. They're so good. Maybe they move out of state and they go to a new town and they don't have anybody to play with because they're just so much better than everybody. So it's like, oh, forget it. And I'm kind of burned out anyway. 
the people who pick up and they they're playing or maybe they picked up in high school tennis or they're they start in their 30s 40s 50s you all never stop playing that's number one yeah. and then i was given a lesson this one guy said i said uh who who learns faster adults <coughs> or kids and he goes oh man kids learn so much faster than adults <laughs> and i don't think so I really don't. I think that's I think that's a bunch of BS. First of all, the adults, they're paying their own money. They want to get it. To me, yeah. I find that adults actually learn a lot faster than kids a lot of times. Now, there's some kids who are just freaks, but there's also some adults I work with who are freaks and they just learn super fast. Yeah. But the difference is, is the expectation as an adult is so out of whack because you're an adult and because you feel like the, the clock is against you, you want to have a kick serve in, in two months where if you watch a kid who's 12, 13 or 14, and all of a sudden you see they got a beautiful serve. How long do you think it took them to get that serve? You know, they were serving for months at like, you know, I'm sure they were 10 years old and for months they were hitting this floppy flying floaty thing that was a slice but everybody at the club was going, oh, my God, good, good for you. You've got spin on that. That's amazing. And everybody's got the patience to watch that develop for three or four years. You yeah. really have an adult who will accept that challenge of doing it in three or four years. Where for a kid, I'm telling you, every kid that you've seen that you go, they have an amazing serve. I wish I started when I was, when I was that young. No, they just had the patient, the coach, the parent. And the kid had the patience to develop it for about three to four years. Jorge, am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, I think you're right. And one of the things you said there regarding, you know, wishing that you started early. Uh, I have this analogy. I started tennis late and, you know, I started when I was 15, basically. My first tournament was in the 16th and under. So at the time, um, I, you know, when I went to the club, all those other kids that were in the higher levels they had been playing forever and i looked up to them and i was like oh my gosh these guys are crazy um but here's the the thing um i've coached a lot of high performance kids right and i'll give i'll go to the very top there's three kids i coach three girls actually that all won gold balls okay so peter knows what that is you, you that means you're a junior and you're not and you win a national championship the national championship okay so super high level. They all play D, D1 tennis. Two of the three were all Americans. They're all in their 30s and 40s right now. And guess how many of them play tennis? <laughs> None. Yep. Wow. They are not the ones. I probably could look up 100 Midwest ranked kids, sectionally ranked kids, and see how many are playing. It's going to be 10. But I have hundreds of adult players who started when they're 20, 30, 40, or 50. Uh, and they're still playing. So that, that is a, a misnomer. Don't wish that you started too much. Uh, plus, your body might be more broken down than that. But I do think that when it comes to learning, um, the, the biggest problem I think that adults have is that th they have this in their head, like, oh, I'm getting old and I want, you know, the ratings kind of haunt them. You know, they judge themselves. <laughs> um you know, I'm a three five and I can't believe I've been trying like crazy to get to a four oh. Well, I, I kind of like the ratings because they, they serve as a incentive, right? But I really hate it when you start associating your rating with your, your personness, you know. And one of the, the things that bugs me the most, I still work at a tennis club. I manage the club, I'm still on the court a little bit. <laughs> it's just how and this is something I, I wish adults would do less of. The four O's they don't want to play with the, th the three fives, okay? The three fives, they don't want to play with the, with the three O's. And it's just too territorial. <laughs> um, when I played, I started late, but I played a ton of matches. I would play anybody and everybody. Um, I played a kid, the same kid, Chris Bajima. We were both kind of, you know, I was an immigrant, and he came from a broken family. We just, we couldn't do lessons. So we played each other like 15 sets a week. I played the same freaking guy 15 sets a week. Because we didn't know anybody else, uh, and we couldn't go to the club and pay for lessons. So um, I would play if if I play somebody and one oh and oh, I I'll play. If I play somebody and kick them butt, I'll play. So that would be one thing I wish that was a little different about you know rec tennis in our country. It's just it's too territorial. Uh, we don't want, and then you know why? You know the four oh doesn't want to play with a three five because if they lose, then that three five is going to tell a few friends. With, 
It, it's just all garbage in your head. Play the freaking game of tennis. Have fun and, and get off all that stuff. And I think it'll be more fun uh, for sure. Yeah. Now, here's a good question that Tracy had. Do you find that students usually overrate themselves or underrate themselves? It's a good question, Tracy. Um, yeah. So my personal experience is that it's all over the place. And I would say slightly more than half overrate themselves. Um, you got some outliers. You know, I've had people come to the club that say I'm a 4.5 player and they're a 3.0 player. Like, what? You know, they're my, but they just come something wrong in their head, I think. Um, but I, I get everything. Over the years, I've coached literally thousands of USTA elite players and, and one my old club. We had 37 teams uh, just out of that one club. So I coach a lot of them. Um, it's a, another thing that's kind of odd, and I hope this isn't controversial, but it's my reality, is I've had a lot of um, female USTA lead players, and they want to go up. They want to go up so bad. They want to go from 4 to 4 5 or 3 5 to 4 0. Oh. And the men are a little different. The men almost cheat. They want to stay down because they want to win a trophy and go to state. So I got 4 0 oh guys. They get right after four or five, and they're totally no, I'm not a four, you know, because they don't want to leave their buddies. So a lot of it is different motivation. I said it's a little bit gender, not always that way, but I would say for me, my personal experience is most people want to go up, but there is a faction uh, more almost always with guys that are um, looking that not to go up, especially if they're lead players because they want to play at the three five level. We we're state contenders at three five. I go to four zero, we're gonna get our bus kicked. I don't care that. It's not a big thing to me to say I'm 4 I want to go to state more than I want to have a label. So it's kind of interesting. But I think for me, it's slightly more than half probably overrate themselves versus under. How about you? I, 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 think, I think like you said, it's probably about half. I mean, you know, it's all kinds of different personalities. And, you know, a lot of people that I um, coach – especially when they come from other states. I mean, they take they take tennis very seriously. And um, I think, if anything, we tend to beat ourselves up too much as players and people in general. So, I mean, you know, every now and then you get somebody who's a, a braggart and a little obnoxious. But for the most part, uh, especially the online community, when we do these clinics, I mean, most people are just really, really awesome. And, uh, and I feel, if anything, most of my job is making people feel better about themselves. Right. <laughs> Matt, Matt goes, now here's somebody who might be a little off of this numbers. Mm -hmm. Maybe at one point I was, I, I might've been, but I mean, I, I didn't even, I even know what I'd be right now. So, I mean, anyway, um, this was a lot of fun, by the way, uh, Jorge, I don't know. Have you ever watched Matt's coffee break tennis show? Yeah. I watched a few of those. It's amazing guys. You have got to watch his show, especially go look at his last couple of videos. He just made an amazing, um, video where he, he did this. It's incredible. It's about Rafa winning the French open, but then he made it like a song with Rafa and Roger and they're, he, he's doing the acts. It's, it's so darn good. It's a thousand times better than anything on the tennis channel. So definitely. Yeah, I, see, I think I saw one recently. It might, that might've been it. Oh, it is so good. I'm telling you guy is like a, uh, he's he's really good, and he's part, and he's coming on um, tomorrow. Tomorrow his presentation is going to be up. It's on big numbers, and he actually, when he wants to get serious and make some amazing points, he's also great at that too. Matt's a very talented uh, person. Um, so, uh, guys, I just want to make sure too. First of all, you can ask some questions now. Uh, the people who did purchase last night off Will's link, you can email me if you if you did not get your bonus. But Will told me that they did send out the bonus um, email today with your link. So um, the people who were on last night, if you're on and you and you bought off Will's link last night, it's kind of like every night we kind of have like, you know, let's make a deal. You kind of have to remember that show where you you're in the audience and you got to decide, like, do I pick that's behind curtain there? And be, we're kind of playing that this week. Um, and so if you did pick the curtain last night. You got something amazing from Will. He gave you 15 plays from the Bryan brothers. But tonight, you saw how Jorge, Jorge just gave you three tips, and he's pretty darn good. But Jorge, it, it, we're going to put Jorge's special link in there right now. And um, Yeah, I'll pull up my bonus. Is that, yeah, and you pull up your bonus. I've actually got to go get the link. 
Okay. My my mine was going to be the StreamYard link, so I definitely don't want to put that in there. <laughs> then all of a sudden, people be in our studio looking at it. Um, all right. So this is Jorge's special link. So if you if you go off that link, you can you can get TennisCon and you can get this amazing bonus that yeah. Jorge is going to walk you through right now. Yeah, so this is uh, my course dashboard where all my courses live, and there's a bunch of them here. But this one in particular, this Pro Practice Secrets course, I'm going to take you in it. That's the that's the bonus that I have for people that buy through TennisCon for through my link. Um, and this is one of our larger courses. Uh, basically, this think about this. This is um, a practice system. Pro Practice Secrets is a course I made because I felt the way that pros practice was so different than how rec players practice uh, that I really spent tons of time helping people understand how to better practice. So I'm just going to click it so you can see it. I think it's always good to see. So this course, uh, like most courses, the, all the content is on the left and then the big video is on the right. You just kind of. So the first module is an introduction module. It talks about all these different teaching theories that kind of to get you aligned with the way I think. And then we're going to talk about serving. And the whole course is based on the five play situations, which when you play tennis, you may know you only do five things ever. You're serving, you're returning, playing from the baseline, playing for the net, or hitting passes and laps. So what I did is I turned those into modules. The serving module has all these videos here uh, just on serving, okay? Different ways you practice your serve on your own. Uh, the return to serve module, here's a whole bunch of lessons on the return to serve, okay? The baseline play module, here's a bunch of games that you can play and train, especially with a buddy. This is really intended for you to do it with a with a friend. Or, or you could do it with a coach. The net play, uh, that's number four, play situation, all kinds of videos and stuff about that. And then number five, the final play situation is passing shots and lobs, and I have a bunch of drills that teach you how to do it. So a drill is just, you know, we go in there, we, we show you the drill. Uh, but we have some bonuses in here. This is a one-on-one -on -one workout. This is what I, I work out that you and a partner go and do. It's a sheet you can print out. Um, and it's really how, this is probably one of the better things I've done. Um, you print this sheet out and it's your scoreboard and you take it with you on the court. And then the modules in here are me teaching you each of those games. And we have a doubles version of that. And then the, and it ends with the third bonus being some group drills. So um, big, big course, probably 80 some videos in there. It's one of our flagship courses. And um, definitely um, one of my prouder courses, and you can check it out. It's uh, it's free to you. It, it sells for 247 on this website. Um, but if you buy it through my link, you get the whole course uh, included on top of all the stuff that Peter's doing. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that, Peter, chance to show people that. But that's basically what my bonus is uh, this year. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, and it's a course. And as you can see, Jorge is very, very detailed with his instruction. Um, that's why he is a master pro in both PTR and USPTA because he is, he's a master. I mean, when he puts his all into it, he goes above and beyond. He goes all over the country and speaks. He runs the club. He makes amazing videos. I mean, he does everything top notch. And I think you can tell this through looking through that. It's pretty awesome. And, um, you know, it's a $247 gift. And, and you know, the, the thing that, and Jorge and I were talking about this the other day, and it was kind of interesting. I was out to um, late lunch with my girlfriend today, who's uh, a, a doctor, and, and she was talking about books that she's got to buy. And the books are like three, 400 bucks. And you're like, well, is a book really worth three or 400 bucks? But I'm like, yeah, well, the person who wrote it is an expert and they like put all their heart into it. I mean, you know, it, it could definitely be worth that, especially when it's teaching you. And, you know, with all these lessons with tennis con, it's easiest to go, oh, they're just videos. Oh, they're just, they're just, they're free. It's like, right. I guarantee you, everybody who made a course spent hours upon hours that you can't even comprehend how long they spent putting the course together. They put a hundred percent of their thought into it going, what do I need to do to unturn every stone on this topic and pour my heart out into the course? That's how courses are made. Just because they're selling for 67 bucks doesn't mean that they're worth 67. I mean, the, the person certainly 
put a lot more, you know, effort into it than $67, you know? So I think that online courses are the biggest undervalued thing for the amount of value you get out of it. It's just, it's just the way it is. It's, I mean, it is what it is, as they say, but it certainly maybe isn't what it should be in my mind. Yeah. Sorry yeah, for the and that's the nice stuff, but some of the things that I see now, and I, you, we've both been in this online tennis world for a while. Some of the things you get for like under a hundred bucks, like the amount of content and who's it's like, that's so different. Even in this, even in this world that we live in, in, in tennis in online instruction three years ago, that didn't exist three years ago. Every course was a couple hundred bucks minimum. And it was just one person. Now you get like world experts type doing triple the content for like under a hundred bucks. It's really, it really is some uh, pretty good deals. Yeah. Yeah. Just with online, I just think, you know, there'll never be another Mona Lisa because we just don't have the attention span anymore. You know, you'll see something amazing on Facebook or Instagram and just cause it's there for you. Just kind of, Oh, that's really cool. What's next? You know, that's, I mean, they, no one's going to be driving around today looking for, you know, I mean, now that we know it's a historic piece of art, we we, we go to it. But I guarantee if it was draw, drawn today, people are not traveling all over the world just to look at it. I promise you that. Yeah. So, but anyway, we had a great time tonight. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for coming in. Peter, thanks for having me. Oh, you are amazing. I'm putting Jorge's link in there. So the way this works, guys, is – because some people are confused. When you go, when I'm saying Jorge's link, I don't mean you're going to see like an offer from Jorge Capistani. You're going to see TennisCon 4 and you're going, and we'll actually, we'll review what's going to be on tomorrow. That's a good way where you can kind of get an idea of what's in TennisCon. The, the amount of content is crazy there. Who got to watch today? I thought today was really, really good. Um, but you're going to go to his link to buy TennisCon and get lifetime access. What does that mean? It means all the videos that you saw today, like for instance, Monday night, Monday that you saw yesterday, big serving is going away tonight at midnight. That's basically that page will expire. So if you want a lifetime access pass, you get to look at all these videos, which are really, really great. You get to look at them at your own time, anywhere, anytime you want and review them over and over again, year after year, which is really how it should be done. And and uh, and you're gonna see that that's what is there when you go. What does that mean? It means. Um, but what happens is through the back end, we can see that you bought off Jorge's link, and I can send him the list, and then Jorge will then go to to his email service that he uses, and he'll email you sometime tomorrow and say, "Here's my bonus." That's how it works in case you're confused. Uh, Cause I don't think I did a good enough job ex maybe explain that with some of the questions that come in. Cause like, oh, I'm looking for Jorge's special link. Jorge's special link is TennisCon. Um, I'm going to share my screen just to preview tomorrow. So you can see what's up tomorrow. We're gonna be emailing you guys out around uh, between eight and 9 a.m. and you can dive in. And again, you get to watch Wednesday for for 48 hours or maybe it's a little less than 48 hours you get you get to basically watch it till what wednesday thursday night um and let's go to the videotape uh can can you guys see that can you see that jorge yeah okay oh by the way also i have my bonuses which are not too shabby too when you get tennis con you're also going to get, get a 30, 30 videos, they're one to two minute tips on how you can add five to 15 miles an hour. And it's basically like the tips that have been golden tips for me that I've been with a student, we had an aha moment. I'm like, oh, that works. Like when I communicate that to people, they get it and they can instantly improve. That's what that is. Um, 30 day no man left behind challenge. That's basically where you're gonna get an email for 30 days on different topics. We did in tennis con one to three videos a day. So you can really take your time and study the material rather than just forgetting about it. And as well with that, you're also gonna have a video ask link. So we'll start this like next week um, where you can send me serves, forehands, backhands, I'll take a look at it and, and help you out. Or you can just ask questions. Uh, if you like these live streams, I picked out my top 10 live streams, which Jorge is uh, on the list in the top 10. And so you can watch some of our live streams, my favorites. And also the best of what we've done at Newcomb's Ranch. You saw Matt Bradshaw, my buddy Matt. Uh, we usually go out there and have a great time at the ranch. And we interview people like John Newcomb, Rod Laver, 
uh, Roy Emerson. This is kind of crazy when you think about it. The uh, Jensen brothers, Mark Woodford, Mark Philpusis, that's all in there. Um, this was Monday, which again, as I'm scrolling down, remember all these amazing videos are going away tonight at midnight. They're going bye-bye, as well as the Tennis Express uh, video. Today, you, you got to see all these amazing videos, which I thought was pretty awesome. I do know that we had a little bit of trouble with DeVore's video in the beginning of the day, which made me want to throw my computer into the wall and smash it in a million bits, but I fixed it. Yay. It's all good. It was fixed around 10 a.m. this morning. Um, our buddy Maribon, this guy from Italy, did a great job. That's Naomi Osaka's hitting partner. <laughs> this guy only won the Australian Open doubles, Ellis Ferrer, with his uh, uh, John Eagleton, who's really good online. Um, this guy was awesome. Steven, a great instructor, 15 points of tennis. I wish he'd make more videos. Back One hand backhand lessons, really solid. And then a really cool lesson on the forehand to add forehand velocity. Okay, that's what happened today. This is what's up tomorrow. What's up tomorrow? I got Katie McNally's coach. Katie plays um, with Coco Golf, and we're talking about smart power. Like when you know you want to play aggressive, but how and when to do it. And uh, it's pretty neat. Katie McNally. I know Coco has gotten a lot of the, the kind of the stardom. But Katie is not at all far behind. First of all, she had Coco Goff dead to rights in the junior French Open. Should have beat her, but Coco, you know how tough she is. We already see how many comebacks she's already had. Coco came back and beat her in three sets. She took Serena Williams to three sets last year at the U.S. Open. She won like two or three rounds this year at the U.S. Open. And she, um, I think they got to the quarterfinals last year at U.S. Open doubles. I mean, she's pretty awesome. We all know this guy right here, Ian, with his big, beautiful board. He goes through and we're talking about uh, the right stuff, how righties can, you know, exploit lefties. And both Ian and I were kind of spilling to the T on the lefty, which kind of hurt because I'm a lefty. He's a lefty. But uh, we also talked about how to beat lefties and righties as a righty. So it's kind of a righty lesson. Will Hamilton, who we had last night, who is awesome. Um, this is uh, he released a new play from the Bryan brothers called The Marshall Plan. So it's never been seen before. And we have it. Uh, this one is super cute and very informative, and I don't think there's enough instruction on it online. We have Brent Abel and Mai. They're married. They're super awesome, and they have won several gold balls together. And uh, they talk about you know chemistry and what what's right to do on a mixed doubles court, what's wrong to do on a mixed doubles court, and also what kind of strategies that go beyond regular doubles that actually work better that they like to run in mixed doubles over just a regular match. This person right here needs no introduction. Gigi Fernandez with her beautiful smile, 17 Grand Slam champion, and it's how to beat players that are stronger than you. Uh, that's what's happening tomorrow. This is this lady right here won the NCAAs when she was a Georgia Bulldog, and she is talking about leftiness, you know, how we think different, different shots we play. Uh, John Eagleton and Ellis are back with how to volley on different surfaces. So he got to the uh, – won the Australian Open, finals the U.S. Open, I think semis of Wimbledon, quarters of the French. So he knew what to do on different surfaces and doubles and talks about the different plays you want to be running out there. This right here, I'm sure Jorge must know him. Do you know him? Oh, yeah. Pat is a good guy for the southern section for sure. He's yeah. probably here many times to speak at conventions. Yeah. Pat Whitworth, you guys probably don't know who he is because he's not doing online videos that much, but this guy is a coaching legend. He, again, is one of the few pros in the world who looked at the master certification and instead of running the other way, said, there's no freaking way I'm going to do that. He said, yes, bring it on. I'm going to become a master pro, and he is one. So he gives a great lesson. Like, it's awesome. Do not miss this lesson tomorrow on poaching. My buddy Matt Bradshaw brought it, okay, a 42-minute video on stats and what wins and how you can use the data and how he'd ignored the big data for a while in his own matches and then decided to deploy it, and it made a big difference in a match he just played, and he was super pumped and wanted to brag about it because Matt loves to brag. Um, <laughs> just kidding, Matt. All right, uh, the grinder blueprint. This is how to beat that annoying pusher. This is uh, Daniel Dotson from Hammer at Tennis, who's got a really good YouTube channel. Uh, he's posting more and more lately, and I think he's really, really very good at what he does. 
And then look, it's like Ellis and um, John, they just can't get enough of tennis con. They have another video on modern tennis strategy. And this is that kind of interesting. If you watch, go to YouTube, watch Ellis play with Rick Leach against Leighton Hewitt and Max Murney, and you can see that Ellis is like really good, and he crushes forehands and backhands. So he hits rockets, but he said he actually, I think he's around 50 years old. He says his forehand is better today because he picked up the modern style, and he wishes he could turn back the clock and go back and play on the tour because he thinks his forehand is better today. So talking about you know, being able to teach a quote unquote old, old dog new tricks, you know, and I'm in the old dog category. So I'm not, uh, you know, at all making fun of Ellis here. We're, we're all like trying to keep getting better. He says his forehand is better today than it was when he was on tour and go watch him play on tour. The guy was awesome. And yeah, so that's tomorrow. That's not bad, right? That's a pretty good day. And we also, I believe, have another Tennis Express video tomorrow. So. Right. Big day tomorrow. That's just one. That's one day right there. I mean, that right there. That day could be. I would argue worth easily sixty-seven, ninety-seven bucks. However you want to put it. However you want to put it, Jorge. I love it, man. Yeah. Great so work. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to put Jorge's link in one more time. <laughs> Yeah, David David Lee, who won a hundred dollar gift card the other day by winning our trivia. Maybe we'll do trivia tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we're going to be live with Maribon Aranshad from the Tennis Files, and nice. maybe tomorrow night we might do a little tennis trivia and give away another gift card. Cool. But we had a great time, Jorge. You are amazing. I think it's time for you to go to sleep. What do you think? Sounds good, buddy. I'm going to go put take the dog out. <laughs> go take the dog out. I love your dog. All right, buddy. Our dogs have to meet. Everybody have a good night. Thank you for staying on so long and being so passionate about the game. We'll see you tomorrow.